Okay, where in the universes are we? Um, this is a talk that's been ongoing for some years, and it's been in development for quite a while. But the fundamental understandings that I arrived at a few years ago still hold, and I expect that they're going to hold for a long time to come, even in the face of a lot of the, under, of a lot of the growing evolution of the science of astronomy. So this is fairly basic stuff. This is not advanced highfalutin astronomy. Um, but what I want to do is to get you up to date on the current state of modern astronomy and how to view the Urantia book in relation to it. Um, it's going to be an extended presentation because I really have to cover a lot of ground. So it isn't, it isn't going to be a quick run through. And, I, and so be patient and go carefully with me through it. Um, and again, the talk is largely oriented towards Urantia readers who are familiar with the language of the book. So this is not intended to be an introduction to astronomy for new readers to the book. It's meant to help uh, clear up some of the confusion that characterizes our reading of the Orangia book and a lot of the terms that relate to astronomy in the Orangia book. So really what I'm after is reconciling, or reconciling of the Orangia book with modern astronomy. The, um, the talk is going to be split into two parts. Um, we're going to be covering the times and the appearance of the Orangia book, the language of the times, uh, the state of the science of the times. We're going to use source material books that the Orangia book was derived from um, and current science. A lot of the slides are pretty wordy, which is something that shouldn't happen very much in presentations, but we really need to take a careful look at a lot of what the Orangia book says. And this is also on the internet, and so to provide internet readers a chance to see the material, it's also there too. Um, and you will have a chance to go on the internet to review everything that's done here if you want to do it more in depth. So let's get rolling. Uh, the term universes. 1936, Webster's Universal Dictionary. Definition, universe. Designates the mass of worlds with everything associated with them comprehending all stars, planets, satellites, comets, etc., regarded as one system. Hmm, that doesn't seem to say anything about galaxies. Didn't they know? Definition, galaxy, the Milky Way, the long, white, luminous track which seems to encompass the heavens like a girdle, occasioned by a multitude of stars at so vast a distance as to be distinguishable apart only by the most powerful lenses an island universe. So in 1936, when this dictionary was written, the Urantia book, as, as, it, as it regards itself as having been written in 1934, these definitions should be relatively current with the writing of the Urantia book. And the definitions do include the term galaxy, and they do include the word universe and Milky Ways. But the question is, is were these galaxies, universes, Milky Ways, and nebulae distinguishable, either astronomically or by definition, at the time of the appearance of the Orangia book? And that's part of what we have to cover. So um, what we're going to look at now is the interchangeability of the usage of these terms in the Orangia book. Urantia book. You have also been informed that there are in process of organization vast galaxies of universes far out beyond the periphery of the grand universe in the first outer space level. We have not the slightest doubt that in due time these enormous galaxies will become inhabited universes. What to make of vast galaxies of universes, galaxies becoming universes? Isn't this backwards? Nope, not if you're living in the 1930s. It's it's very curious that the terminology that was characteristic of the 1930s is not a terminology that we're familiar with now. Um, the definitions that we saw before were relevant to the 1930s, um, but we have an admixture of definition throughout the Urantia book. And the Revelatory Commission could not quite anticipate our current usage of terms. So the crux of the problem is we have a twofold language issue. We, we absolutely, as Urantia book readers, we treasure the, the, the language of the Urantia book. We hang on every word in the Urantia book because it's lovely. It's a, it's a masterpiece of the English language. But in the course of doing that, we also carry the baggage of our 21st century understandings of the language back into the reading 
of a 1930s language. So that's a problem. And then the Revelatory Commission, as they were writing the Arantia book, as they were helping write the Arantia book back at that time and borrowing from other books that were current at that time, had the problem themselves of how to anticipate the use of language. What language would hold up for subsequent times after the Arantia book had appeared? And let me give you a, a real interesting example. The term galaxy or galaxies that we take so much for granted is only used 21 times in the Arantia book. That's the, that's the only number of times it occurs where the term universe or universes occurs 3,000 times. So we're going to look at, at a little bit of that usage of language as we try to understand what was being meant when the Arantia book was re being written. Um, this is an example, this slide is an example of people like me at star parties. This is, this is, uh, this is an average star party and um, that great big telescope in the middle is mine and as I note at the bottom, just jokingly, if you wonder why I'm qualified to give this talk, it's because my telescope is probably bigger than your telescope. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I'm also privileged to, um, my, my background's in physics, but I'm also privileged to be, at the, to be connected with the University of Michigan. Our astronomy club is the University of Michigan related club. It's a big club. And we provide all the, all the opportunities for the university, for people at the university to view the stars. And as a result, I'm also in a privileged position to stay really on the top of the field of astronomy with all uh, the best minds in astronomy who come through the university to talk. So that's, it's been a wonderful advantage of me to be there um, and so I'm really happy to help you guys understand what's going on in the Arantia Book with astronomy because I am in this other position of getting the, getting the best of the best uh, coming through the university to talk to us so I can help bring, that uh, bring those understandings to you. So let's start with where everything did start. We're going to look back at the time, uh, earlier times, and I call this slide Cosmic Citizenship. Mythologies of cosmic citizenship have been with us for a long time. They've been with us forever, uh, whether it's in scripture or right up to the present. And I absolutely love this slide. This slide is the slide of a shepherd boy. It's a woodcut from the Middle Ages. And as we're looking at it here, this woodcut is colorized. It wasn't obviously done in color at the time it was produced, but this is exactly the woodcut from um, you know 500 years ago. Uh, and this woodcut, embedded, embedded within this woodcut, is an understanding of the story of the times of the Middle Ages. So we have a shepherd boy who's in this wonderful position to be having this cosmic experience. His mind is being expanded. How does he interpret his experience? What does he think he is seeing once he's seen it? So his head is extending out through the bowl of lights in the heavens. So when we look at this image and we see these wonderful little groups of stars, these six-pointed stars in the bowl, there was no concept of stars at the time in the Middle Ages, no concept. But there were lights in the heavens. And generally, people still regarded the Earth as being flat, even though there was an emerging understanding that the Earth was, was really round. And as he gazes into the sky, into this beyond the sky, through the bowl of the heavens, you can, we, we're going to re read the words of Ezekiel here as an interpretation of what he's seeing. This was the appearance and structure of the wheels. They sparkled like chrysolite, and all four looked alike. Each appeared to be made like a wheel intersecting a wheel. So the image of wheels in the background, doesn't it make you wonder, what was Ezekiel seeing when he was visualizing these wheels in the background? And with our minds in the 20th, 21st century, maybe those were galaxies. Maybe those were intersecting galaxies that he was <laughs> visualizing. But at the time of the, of, you know, of the Middle Ages, how could you possibly have, have, have any idea as to what was being visualized when there was no concept of anything more than an amorphous heaven? It was not a heaven full of stars, a heaven full of objects, unless it were these wheels. So we had an amorphous heaven, we had a flat earth, and with the suspicion that life probably went on after death, there really was only one place to come back to. It was either below the earth, back to the surface of the earth, or toward 
an amorphous heaven above. And that's, that was the mythology of that time. There are other mythologies. I'm just going to briefly touch on a couple of other mythologies here. One is this wonderful Hindu belief that the earth is supported on elephants who in turn are standing on top of a tortoise. Who knows, I, I wish I knew more about the mythology of, of that to understand what those images really represent. But it's another beautiful view. And here we have, I, I love this cartoon because it does say something about the Native American experience. Wow, Little Eagle's been telling me the story of how his tribe got started with the help of the bears, buffalo, and eagles. Oh yeah, those are just old myths. That's the trouble with you Europeans. You think that just because something never happened, that it's not true. All of man's universe romancing may not be fact, but much, very much, is truth. A myth explained is a myth drained. I don't know where that comes from, but we, we need our stories. We really need our stories to interpret the universe. No matter how much science we're steeped in, the Stephen science provides a framework for telling stories. These images are from posters that John Byron authored 20-some years ago. Um, and this poster, these images, seem to tell the story of seven super universes surrounding a central universe, surrounding yet something that's outside of time and space, paradise, in the middle. And the seven super universes here are represented as very galaxy-like. And again, as we look into the, the, um, the more extended traversal from the Earth to paradise, um, Byron has included all the terms that the Urantia book uses in our progression towards paradise, from solar system to local system to constellation to local universe, minor sector, major sector, and on to the central universe. From the pre-scientific, pre-20th century journey of all religious systems to a nebulous heaven over the Earth, the Arantia Book's tale of a scientifically comprehensible journey across countless worlds and galaxies of space to a paradise beyond space and time. The fascination of the Hubble Space Telescope images could draw mankind to his new retelling of our destiny amidst a fully inhabited universe. Yeah, so we're really in this wonderful position to have access to the Hubble Space Telescope images, which are just captivating humanity's interest. And the Arantia Book really speaks exactly to the images that are coming from the Hubble Space Telescope. So we really have a story that wonderfully fits a newly emerging science. So at, at this point in time, um, what, I would, what I would do, what I should do, is to try to get everybody up to speed on how the universe is put together astronomically. And I need to start up another piece of software to demonstrate that. Okay, in this piece of software, I want to make sure that everyone is up to speed on how the universe works with this particular piece of software. This is um, a collection of 28,000 galaxies mapped um, within a 700 million light year cube. Now, 28,000, given the fact that the universe, as we currently understand it to be, of 200 billion galaxies within a 13 billion galaxy age of the universe, 28,000 is pretty small. On the other hand, these neighboring 28,000 galaxies um, emit light in a way that's, that astronomy is able to actually grab the light and say very significant things about how close or far away those galaxies are. So every, every little dot in this image, as you're looking at these dots on the screen, are galaxies. These are not stars. And so here's, again, a semblance of our own Milky Way. Note that, note that this is a barred spiral. We have these, as the book phrases it, two great streams of stellar coils wrapping around. And I'm able to take this image of the Milky Way, and I'm able to turn it on its edge. So we're essentially taking the universe and doing a 3D manipulation of the entire universe. And as we look just below, if we were in the southern hemisphere, we could see this guy, which is the Large, Ma Large Magellanic Cloud, and this guy, which is the Small Magellanic Cloud, and these are small satellites of the Milky Way. So right in our own neighborhood, we have a couple of major companions. In fact, what we can do is we can travel a little bit to another major neighbor, and we're going to go and find, because the Andromeda Galaxy is such a, a very important companion 
Here's the Andromeda Galaxy, and it's very nearby. Andromeda is just right on our doorstep. And again, we can see on both sides of the whole thing. In fact, if I rotate around enough, we might be able to see the Milky Way behind it. Um, at any rate, let's go back home. And the next thing we're going to do is we're going to zoom in. And the only stars that are plotted in this whole image of the universe are right here ahead of us, and we're zooming in on this group of stars, and we are heading towards the Earth. If you look at the very bottom of the image, you can see that we are here about a thousand light years from home. And as we continue to zoom in, the sun begins to appear, and we're only 60 light years from the Earth. And as we get closer, whoops, it came in too far too fast. At this distance, which is about 140 astronomical units, now an astronomical unit is the distance from the Earth to the Sun. If you extend that out 140 times, we begin to see Pluto's orbit approaching us. So we're going to move in to the solar system, and we're going to move in through the boundaries of each one of the orbits, and we're going to head toward the Sun. And there's, oh, we're inside the Sun. Anyway, okay, so. <laughs> Let's back out, and we'll head back out. And I would love to turn our planetary siblings on its side. We'll do that. Let's just do that quickly. So here you can see the orbits of all the planets laid out. In fact, you can see here how Neptune is within the orbit of Pluto. So let's again go home. We'll return home. And home is this gaze of the Milky Way. It's straight ahead of us. And we're going to go out. We're going to take a long distance view away from the Milky Way. And so the Milky Way is always going to remain at the center of everything here. And as we go farther and farther out, I want you to notice that the galaxies that are pictured here are not dots in a very homogeneous looking field. They are all grouped together because that's what galaxies do. And it's important for your understanding of how everything in the universe is put together is to realize the galaxies group together in small clusters and in large clusters. In fact, I can take this whole grouping and I can turn it on edge. See, I can, I can manipulate the entire 700 million light year cube. Let's go out to the entire border here. And the Tully collection at the top is this collection of 28,000 galaxies. So, we're going to go out just a little bit farther here. And if you look at the bottom of the screen, we are 700 million light years away from the Milky Way galaxy. This image of all 28,000 galaxies mapped has something curious, anomalous about it. And that is that in the very middle of the entire image, there's a black area. And this is really, it's really important to get a handle on this because this region of blackness is black for a very simple reason. And it has nothing to do with the fact that there's no galaxies because the reality is there must be tons of galaxies that we can't document that live in this space. The reason that we cannot say anything about those galaxies is because we're in the middle. And if we try to look to see those galaxies, we have to look through all the stars of the Milky Way on edge to see them. So in the night sky, when you look at the band of stars in the night sky, you have to look directly through the band of stars in the night sky to say anything about what lies along this path. So as a result of that, this mapping of the universe looks brain-like or it looks barbell-like. And that's all that we can say about this corner of the galaxy. And we're again embedded within the middle of the whole thing. Now one of the things I can do here is I can highlight various regions and what I want to show you here is there's a group of stars yellowed in the middle and we're going to zoom in on them a little bit because this is our own neighborhood this is our neighborhood of galaxies and as I zoom in the more I zoom in the more you can see that this grouping of galaxies Notice this grouping of galaxies. And I, I, I think this is really important because of phraseology in the Arantia book. Do you remember in the Arantia book it refers to Orvington as having a watch-like shape? And the tendency is to associate that watch-like shape with a galaxy. 
So the early association, the old paradigm association of Orbinson with a galaxy is partially built on that term watch-like. Notice this shape. Look at this shape. This group of galaxies, this enormous group of galaxies has its own watch-like shape. I think this is absolutely fabulous, actually. It's just, <laughs> it's really fun how the uh, Vrendwick phraseology, again, can fit both an old paradigm and a new paradigm. Um, but what I also want to show you here is, again, that this, this grouping of galaxies is grouped together, not just because it's near each other, but because these things are gravitationally bound together. And this gravitational binding and this gravitational motion together, this large-scale motion in the universe, was not documentable until the 1980s, even though the Urantia book seems to suggest a large-scale motion of universes, of galaxies, um, back in the 1930s. Um, we are going to look at one other structure. This is called the Great Wall of Galaxies. This enormous group of galaxies out here, in motion together, might represent something like what the Urantia book refers to as an outer space level. And I want you to notice that the Urantia book again uses a term of voids, that between so-called outer space level, there are areas of voids. Now again, in the 1930s, there was no concept whatsoever of the universe being so chaotic. The universe was known to have lots of galaxies. The universe was known to be in motion. Um, the universe was known to be expanding, but there was no concept of the lack of homogeneity that we now see in the universe. But this huge wall of galaxies is here, and in between clusters of galaxies are huge voids. There are monstrous voids that the universe is made up of between the threads that these collections of galaxies fall on. So that'll give you a good idea. So on the biggest, uh, on the bigger scales, like in, on the Great Wall scale, you might think of the Great Wall as a parallel structure to what the Urantia book might refer to as an outer space level. And as we hone in farther, we might be thinking of this group of galaxies as something like what a super universe might be made off of. And that should get you up to speed on how the universe is put together. Okay, so this next slide, which is something straight out of the Urantia book, and it's the organization of the super universe, is on page 167. And this particular page is something that probably most Urantia book readers are well familiar with, but haven't made any effort to memorize, and I'm not suggesting that anyone bother to try to memorize this page, but it's actually pretty simple, uh, because we all know the system of which Urantia is one of, uh, 606, uh, a system embraces about a thousand worlds. At the very end of the list, a super universe consists of 10 major sectors. Everything else in the middle is multiplications of the hundreds. So at the bottom we have a thousand. A thousand inhabited worlds makes a system, and at the top we have 10 major sectors making up a super universe. And every other grouping within is by the one hundreds. So it isn't really that difficult. The question here is how do we make a relationship? between these terms and what astronomy understands. Um, what I'm going to do right at the beginning of the talk, and this is something that I, I used to hold to the end of the talk, but I think it's useful to give you a glimpse as to where we're going to go with the talk. And the glimpse is uh, that I want you to imagine that a super universe of a thousand minor sectors, so a super universe has 10 major sectors, 100 minor sectors, which is a thousand minor sectors is the equivalent of a super cluster of about a thousand galaxies, which is commonly seen in the night sky. So think of Milky Way, which is the minor sector ENSA within the Virgo super cluster, or super universe of Warvington. Um, continuing with this idea, oh, it, it really, here's, here's, here's a very important point of the talk. I am drawing parallels between what astronomy is looking at and what the Arantia book is talking about. I'm not insisting that the conclusions I'm coming to are the exact conclusions to make. But what I am doing is saying that there are really wonderful parallels with what astronomy looks at and what the Arantia book says. So there is really not the need to feel as confused as Arantia book readers have often felt by the terminology and the cosmology in the book. So that's, that's really the point. And just quickly what we're going to do here, this is in this next slide. 
I'm drawing closer parallels with where we're going to end up in the talk, and I don't want you to try to memorize this now. But again, at the top, we have the understanding that in the Rancho book, the term master universe is used to refer to the universe as we currently use the term. Super universe refers to a super cluster. A major sector in the Rancho book would refer to something like the Virgo cluster of galaxies. A minor sector would be equivalent to our own Milky Way galaxy. That's where we're going to go, and I, that's what I have to walk you through to get you there. Finally, the, um, the, this image we're going to return to also, um, this, is the, this is only the first time that we're going to see these slides. Here we have an image of Urantia and the Milky Way at the middle of the local group of galaxies, surrounded by these colorized images of super clusters of galaxies. And these super clusters, maybe you call them super universes, are in motion. And they are all in motion around this image here of the great attractor. So we're going to end up here. This is where we're going to end up. The conclusions that I want to walk you to are not brand new conclusions. We've had other great minds, other great minds who are Urantia book readers in the past. Dan Massey and Erwin Ginsberg were really hot on the idea that a minor sector would be equivalent to a galaxy. So I'm not, I'm not extending something new here. I'm just coming at it from a different way. And I'm expanding the context in which, in which it exists. And I also want to say this about the term universe. As we're looking at this image of superclusters of galaxies surrounding our own Milky Way, it looks enormous. And in fact, it is an extremely tiny part of the universe as it's understood. And as I use the term universe to help you get a handle on the idea that we carry baggage into reading the Arantia book when we use the term universe, the term universe, meaning everything, everything, has only been in common use since about the 1940s as a term. We are now in the early 2000s. And guess what? You may not realize it, but the term universe is falling out of disfavor. And we're moving into the terminology that uses the term multiverse. So the term universe has had a 70-year lifespan, and we're about to leave it behind. So the everything, everything image that we've taken for granted, and that's what, people, that's, that's what as the Arantia Book readers do. We walk into reading the Arantia Book with our language, taking for granted an understanding, and it really is problematic. It's baggage that we need to be able to set aside when we read. Here is something real important that the Arantia Book says about itself. Limitations of revelation. Because your world is generally ignorant of origins, even of physical origins, it has appeared to be wise from time to time to provide instruction in cosmology, and always has this made trouble for the future. The laws of revelation hamper us greatly by their prescription of the impartation of unearned or premature knowledge. Any cosmology presented as a part of revealed religion is destined to be outgrown in a very short time. Accordingly, future students of such a revelation are tempted to discard any element of genuine religious truth it may contain because they discover errors on the face of the associated cosmologies therein presented. So we have a problem. And the problem is that the religious truth of most religious systems has really withstood the test of time. Um, and the cosmologies may have been lacking, but the truth underlying them is, is really what's of the essence. Now, the Revelatory Commission knows we needed a Urantia book-sized vision of the universe, and we needed it now. And they didn't want to wait one second to give it to us, but they had to wait a little bit. And they realized at the time that it wouldn't entirely meet the scrutiny of science as it's currently being discovered, but they gave, it, they gave us what they could give us, and we needed it when we needed it. Okay, so what we're going to do here is move on to something real important. And that is, the Arantia Book self-admittedly says that the Revelatory Commission was constrained to use a thousand of the highest concepts pre-existing at the time that the book appeared. And this is one of those books, The Architecture of the Universe. And Matthew Block was the first one to identify this book, as he has identified many, many, many books since then. Um, and Steve Dreyer is also. And so my talk will rely in some measure on the content of the architecture of the universe uh, because it is full of all kinds of great things. And the very first thing we're going to look at is this quote. 
And the architecture of the universe, by the way, is written in 1934. Let anyone think of the universe as complex as our own with that extraordinary cleverness and beauty of design which we observe. Let him think of the problem before him in trying to say something about it to relatively simple-minded people. He will have to give that abstract in very popular form. He will have to use analogies and the like, but you may say that it is undignified to put the truth in the light of analogies and will claim that that which is written should necessarily be the literal truth. Alas, what do you mean by literal truth? I will venture to say that there is hardly anything which you can describe to me in which you do not unconsciously use analogies. Many of us will use quite knowingly an obsol ob obsolete model for the purpose of dis discussing certain phenomena. One must guard against a supposed impregnable reality in many of the things which seem so obviously real to our consciousness. Yeah, isn't this wonderful? It, this is absolutely wonderful. It's almost as though somebody was looking over somebody else's shoulder here. You know, the revelatory commission was looking over this guy's shoulder or he'd been talking to them without knowing it. Uh, because this is exactly how the Arantia book was written when it was written. So here's, here's an example of how the Arantia book is the universe by analogy. The immensity of the far-flung creation of the Universal Father is utterly beyond the grasp of finite imagination. The enormousness of the Master Universe staggers the concept of even my order of being. But the mortal mind can be taught much about the plan and arrangement of the universes. You can know something of their physical organization and marvelous administration. You may learn much about the various groups of intelligent beings who inhabit the seven super universes of time and the central universe of eternity. Um, our imaginations are not up to the size of the universe. Our, we, we use terms like galaxy and we try to pretend to ourselves that we really understand that what we have, the term we've used is something we really know what it means. But when you're talking millions and billions of objects, we're kidding ourselves. The universe is staggeringly huge, and yet the Revelatory Commission has given us the Arantia book and this staggeringly huge vision, knowing that we really can, can absorb something. And as Arantia book readers, we know why, because we have within us this indwelling spirit of God, and we have a super consciousness that's capable of absorbing content that's far beyond anything our conscious minds can embrace. So we really are feeding ourselves, we are feeding ourselves images that will last an eternity with the Arantia book. Um, but this is the universe by analogy. We are given analogical images to work with. Now from page one of the architecture of the universe, this is really sweet. It has always been one of the alluring games of mankind to speculate upon the why and wherefore of this universe of ours, to seek the explanation of things, the fundamental cause of it all. If the period from the dawn of history be shrunk into a day, we shall find that the first 23 hours of that day are barren, for it is only in the last hour that science was born. And even as the human child develops in its struggle, so in the last 10 minutes of its existence, in the last 35 years of actual time, it has outshone all the achievements of its youth and has torn from nature more of her secrets than she had vouchsafed to man in the whole previous history of existence. And why has this great revelation been so long delayed? Yeah, isn't that wonderful? Why has this great revelation been so long delayed? Well, embedded within the paragraph is, we cannot, take for, we, we cannot take for granted how, what an explosion of scientific understanding took place. Again, the book, this book has been written in 19, 1934, and in the previous 50 years, there was an explosion from a pre-scientific era to a scientific era in all fields of science. So why, in this case, this is one of the examples that I use, and as an astronomer, why was this great revolution so long delayed? because the Revelatory Commission needed to wait for, and here we have Edwin Hubble. And we needed Edwin Hubble to tell us a few things. 
The Revelatory Commission needed him to arrive at his scientific understandings before they could finish telling us, or begin to tell us their story. And so the first thing was... 1923, that the universe was bigger than the Milky Way and contained millions of other island universes. 1929, that space itself is expanding. All galaxies are fleeing apart from each other. The further away, the faster the recession. So science now provides the background for telling us something about who God is among the galaxies, not in, an, not in an amorphous heaven, but God among the galaxies. Galaxies that are fleeing apart from each other in an enormous universe. So that stage is set. Here we have a, a series of uh, images, you, you know, as, with 21st century eyes, we instantly recognize these. We see that they are spiral galaxies, irregular galaxies, elliptical galaxies, and that they're all way beyond the Milky Way. And we take this for granted. We just know this. We learn it in grammar school. But almost 100 years ago, when Hubble took these incredible photos, and these photos are 100 years old. They are marvelous photos. So even 100 years ago, they were taking images of the universe as we currently see it today in staggering beauty. They just did not know what they were looking at. <laughs> and they really thought that these fun, nebulous-looking images were embedded within our own Milky Way. And they thought that these were simply star-forming regions. There was really not a good concept. So this was so amazing that the Hubble Space Telescope was named after Edwin Hubble because of the work he did. So we're going to have to learn a little bit of science because to, to validate some of the parallels that I want you to eventually arrive at about terminology, we have to take a look at Hubble's work. Andromeda. Andromeda is mentioned in the Arantia book, and it's significant in terms of how it's mentioned. Andromeda is our nearest neighbor. It's our biggest neighbor. It's, it's like the Milky Way in size. And it was Hubble's favorite destination for probing his accruing understanding of astronomy. Uh, here's a really curious understanding about Andromeda that you may not realize. This is just astounding. This wonderful image of Andromeda, uh, which is clearly photographic, if the full moon in its path across the night sky were to cross Andromeda's path, the full moon would occupy only this big an area of Andromeda in the night sky. So if you could superimpose this photograph on the night sky and the moon and see it with the moon at the same time, Andromeda is many times the size of the full moon in the night sky. But it really in a very dark sky conditions, so you're going to be able to get to some pretty dark sky. Andromeda is a nice little fuzz patch up in the sky. It doesn't look as big as the full moon, but it actually is that big. It is that huge and it is that close. It's only 10 times its own diameter away from us, and it's enormous. So it was Hubble's favorite destination. And in this uh, greater definition photograph, Hubble labels a few of the structures that he sees in Andromeda. He sees a star cloud here. He sees an open cluster here. He sees a globular cluster here and a Cepheid variable here. And these are the kinds of objects that make up a galaxy. These are the primary objects. And I want you to notice the term star cloud, the label star cloud. The star cloud of Nebadon is referred to by name three times in the Arantia book. So think of the idea of Nebadon as being one of a hundred local universe star clouds peppered around the shape of a minor sector galaxy. So you can see the shape. And it's actually fairly easy just to visualize how this grouping of star cloud stars, how there could easily be about 100 of those within any given galaxy in a geographical area. And again, notice the Cepheid. This, this slide, if you look carefully, and it's, it's not, you really have to pay a little bit of attention here because the stars in this view, some of them are blinking on and blinking off. They are dimming and brightening. And these variable stars, uh, this is actually speeded up, are, are, they are key in Hubble's research because they're called Cepheid variable stars. And a woman astronomer back at the turn of the century was the one who really documented 
these stars, and they discovered at that time that Cepheid variable stars were really noted for having a correlation between their brightening and dimming. So Cepheid share identical characteristics of brightness versus periodicity. And as Hubble is looking out, and he is seeing Cepheid variables brightening and dimming, and he's seeing them in Andromeda, he's realizing they have to be a really long way away because they don't appear, they have all the characteristics of Cepheid variables, but they're way too dim. So on this next slide, we're, again, this is a, a, a much higher magnification view. We have Hubble, this is Hubble's eureka moment. It's his Cepheid discovery in Andromeda, and go ahead and read this. In 1923, Edwin Hubble was examining photographic plates of the Andromeda Nebula taken with the 100-inch telescope in order to find Nova, stars that would suddenly increase in brightness. On October 5th and 6th, 1923, Hubble located three nova, each marked with an N. One of these nova turned out to be a Cepheid variable, a star that changes period, period predictably in brightness, and the N was crossed out, and the star was relabeled VAR. Yeah, this is, this is, this is just incredibly important. So here's this, here's this little nova, and it's crossed out, and it's a variable star with an exclamation point. Oh my God, what have I discovered? <laughs> So in this next slide, uh, there's a little notation at the top that says this is the single most important slide in this presentation. Pay attention to this one because the Arantia book <coughs> borrows Hubble's Eureka moment to tell us how big that a super universe that Orbiton must be. This is without question the defining phraseology in the Arantia book to hold on to. In one group of variable stars, the period of light fluctuation is directly dependent on luminosity, and knowledge of this fact enables astronomers to utilize such suns as universe lighthouses or accurate measuring points for the further exploration of distant star clusters. By this technique, it is possible to measure stellar distances most precisely, up to more than one million light years. Better methods of space measurement and improved telescopic technique will sometime more fully disclose the ten grand divisions of the superuniverse of Orvanton. You will at least recognize eight of these immense sectors as enormous and fairly symmetrical star clusters. Yeah, I can't, I can't tell you how long I've been reading the Arantia book before I, I stumbled across this. And even though I have a background in physics and astronomy, for some reason, I had not noticed this paragraph, which is an exact replication of what Hubble's work was about. And I've just walked you through it. We've learned about variable stars. And this is a, a description of the variable stars as they are described in the paragraph. And he's saying that, the original book is saying that Hubble's technique is accurate out to a million light years which happens to also be the distance to Andromeda. So, so the Eurentia book is validating exactly the work of Hubble and saying it's correct. His work is correct. There's nothing faulty with Hubble's work. And on top of that, they're saying that better methods of space measurement in the future and improved telescopic technique will then more fully disclose the 10 grand divisions of Orbiton. So it's a no-brainer. It's clear. We now have those better methods of space measurement. We have the better telescopes. And the better method of space measurement is type 1a supernova. Those are used now to replace the use of Cepheid variables in farther away galaxies. And the Orange Book is saying that now that we have those new improved techniques, we can look and we can document how far away other galaxies are. And now that we have that, we can see the 10 grand divisions, the 10 major sectors of the super universe of Orbiton. So the whole point here is that the, the, the super universe of Orbiton has to be way, way, way out beyond Andromeda. Andromeda is just the beginning of penetrating the size of the super universe of Orbiton. And if Hubble's work, uh, Hubble's work is just the most important work that was done in astronomy to tell us how that the universe consisted of, you know, you have to remember here that at the time of our grandparents, there was only one galaxy in the universe, and that was the Milky Way. The Milky Way equaled 
uh, a galaxy, you remember the term galaxy? is derived from the Greek term galaxios, which means way of milk. And at the time of our grandparents, there was only one galaxy, and in one fell swoop, Hubble is telling us that there are millions of galaxies in the universe. So overnight, there was an enormous change. There was a paradigm shift. And the Arantia book is telling us that Hubble's work is accurate, and it was critically important, and it is critically important to our understanding of the size of the super universe. So here it is in 1938. 1938, Edmund Hubble writes a book called The Realm of the Nebulae. And Hubble, even at this time of 1938, which is 15 years after he's discovered the fact that these nebulae in the universe are not just fuzz patches of infant stars. There is something more. Go ahead and read this. Today the term nebula is used for two quite different kinds of astronomical bodies. On the one hand are the clouds of dust and gases, numbering a few score in all. These have been called galactic nebula. On the other hand are the remaining objects, numbering many millions, which are now recognized as independent stellar systems. These have been called extragalactic nebulae. Since nebula are now known to be stellar systems, perhaps they should be designated by some other name which does not carry the con connotation of clouds or mist. The proposal most frequently discussed is a revival of the term external galaxies. The authoritative definition of galaxy is the Milky Way. So, you know, so the thing to, to observe here is if Hubble is struggling in 1938 to figure out what to call things, think of the trouble the Revelatory Commission had as they were formulating the language of the Arantia book. What are we going to call these objects? How do we name them? We want a name that we can, that's going to stand some test of time, but at the same time, we must use the constraints of modern, of current language usage of the 1930s. So here we are 70 years later, and we are stuck with the baggage of old usage that needs to be translated into the present time. So with the marvelous usage of the language of the Arantia book that we just adore, there is a problem in very specific ways with some usages. The astronomical term nebula has come down through the centuries as the name for permanent cloudy patches in the sky that are beyond the limits of the solar system. The interpretation of these objects has frequently changed, but the name has persisted. Edwin Hubble. So in these four images, to our 21st century eyes, they all look, even though they all look very similar, we clearly know that the first two images here, we see these in magazines all the time, these wonderful Hubble Space Telescope images. Uh, you, can, you, you can find them in several magazines, in any, in any uh, magazine rack. And the first two are exploded stars that have gas shells around them, and the second two are galaxies. And to our eyes, we see that immediately. We can instantly see that. We, we know the difference between what a galaxy looks like and what uh, these are called planetary nebulae, what these are. But at the time that Hubble was working, the assumption was they were all called nebula, nebulae. And they were all thought to be star-forming regions. And in fact, stars are being born in all these regions. But the two on the left, the planetary nebulae, are right nearby. And the two on the right are very far away. And that's what Hubble was able to tell us. But there was a problem because the term nebulae applied to everything. And so Hubble was struggling about, what do we call these things? And it really didn't settle down until the 1940s. So here we have an old paradigm. And this is represented by Byron's, really, Byron has, his, his posters are wonderful. His portrayal of seven galaxy-like super universes scattered around the central universe on the left, under the old paradigm. It's a very useful image, but it's baggage. And it can be constraining baggage if you don't move beyond it. So in the new paradigm now, we have, instead of galaxy-like clusters that form a super universe, we really have super clusters of a thousands, thousands of galaxies in motion together. So on the left, in the old paradigm, we have seven galaxy-like structures in motion. On the right, we have these huge super clusters of thousands of galaxies in motion together. And the Arantia book refers to the Milky Way by name only seven times, where it only referred to galaxies only 21 times. Go ahead, Mike. 
practically all of the star realms visible to the naked eye on Urantia belong to the seventh section of the grand universe, the super universe of Vorvanton. The vast Milky Way starry system represents the central nucleus of Vorvanton, being largely beyond the borders of your local universe. This great aggregation of suns, dark islands of space, double stars, globular clusters, star clouds, spiral and other nebulae, together with myriads of individual planets, forms a watch-like, elongated, circular grouping of about one-seventh of the inhabited evolutionary universes. So there, scattered throughout the Orange Book, there are two paradigms running. There's an old paradigm and a new paradigm. So the Revelatory Commission needs to speak to people current at that time, and they need to speak to us in subsequent generations. And the language of the Orange Book is phrased to do exactly that. And I love this paragraph. This paragraph has been a stumbling block for your ranch book readers for a very long time because it seems to suggest that the vast Milky Way starry system is equivalent to Orbiton, except for the fact that they sneak in this term, spiral and other nebulae. Spiral and other nebulae are galaxies. And at the time of the appearance of the Orange Book in the 1930s, Hubble had already done his work. Something was known about the universe, but the vast, vast, vast majority of mankind was probably absolutely clueless about the fact that there was more than one galaxy in the universe. So that was a task. It was a huge task for the Revelatory Commission to, to phrase a language that could speak to both the previous generations, the current generations, and future generations at the same time. And I wanted, I'm going to come to this very shortly uh, because this paradigm shift took place in the early 1920s, but how many people really knew about it um, very shortly after? And here's the issue. So if you thought, if the Orange Book seemed strange, if, if, if in the course of reading the Orange Book you've thought that the cosmology of the Orange Book seemed a little bit strange, things are even stranger now in astrophysics. So. Here's what I want to ask you. In, as of 1998, there was another paradigm shift that took place. And how many people in this room really have a clue as to what that major total shift in understanding was that took place in 1998? So here we are, 10 years away from this last paradigm shift in 1998, and probably most people in this room would be very hard pressed to say anything about what it was, and it completely changed everything, just as Hubble's work changed everything in the 1920s. And what was arrived at in 1998 was an understanding that the universe must be made of 73% dark energy. That was, a, that was completely unexpected, that finding. The, and, uh, and actually only 10 years prior to that was the, um, was the realization that another 23% of the universe must be made of cold dark matter. So we have a dark matter and a dark energy that make up 96% of the, what the universe must consist of, leaving only 4% in the form of atoms. So think of the fact that everything that science knows about, everything that astronomy knows about, and geology and biology, amounts to, at best, only 4% of the universe that must be out there. How's that for chutzpah? The dark energy, by the way, and I'll just, I'll, just, I'll just touch on this. We have this image of dark matter, and dark matter uh, there's been almost no progress made whatsoever in understanding what dark matter and dark energy are. The progress that's been made has been in understanding what dark matter isn't. For a long time, there was, the, there was an attempt to try to see if dark matter was made up of things like dark stars and dark planets and maybe black holes and things like that. And much work has been done, and it's not there. Um, those are called machos, the massively compact halo objects, and they have not been found. And so what's been settled on now instead in an understanding of dark matter is called WIMPs, weakly interacting massive particles. That's, what's, that's what astronomy is looking for, and with the new, the new collider that's coming online now in, in Switzerland, they're hoping that they might begin to discover something like that. So again, embedded within space, is this is enormous cloud of dark matter that holds every galaxy together. And the amusing thing for us as Orange Book readers is that we know, hey, we've been told something of a story about other kinds of materialization that exists right here, right now. It's called Marantia, and it is gravitationally bound. It is subject to gravitation. And so it's all very amusing, because there is, you know, the Orange Book actually is 
suggest things that, that, that astronomy and physics are grappling with. Um, dark energy, on the other hand, which amounts to something even more in the universe, assumes that embedded within space, it used to be thought that space was nothing. Dark energy demands, uh, here's, the, here's the story. In 1998, it was discovered that the universe is not just expanding, that there's an accelerative component to the expansion. For there to be an acceleration in the expansion of the universe, embedded within space itself, has to be a mechanism that's pushing space apart. And it's referred to in a variety of ways. Uh, quintessence is one of the names. Um, space foam. But embedded within space itself is something that is pushing space apart. The amusing thing, of course, for Urantia book readers is that in this pushing of space apart, in this accelerating expansion, I loved it when I heard about this because as Urantia book readers, we are told that space has a two billion year expansion contraction cycle. Right now, astronomy is, has noted that this expansion cycle has at least started five billion years ago, appears to have no end. Well, the Urantia book says there's a two billion year cycle. Well, astronomy hasn't, hasn't, hasn't found that one yet. But the fun thing is, is that the says that there is a cycle. And if there is a cycle, it means there has to be accelerative expansion and contraction, acceleration, deceleration components in a two billion year expansion contraction cycle. And what astronomy has found is this accelerative component. And we are, we've already been told about that in the story of the Urantia book, that there is exactly that going on. So the Urantia book is, is in its story and again, here, this is, this wonderful pie chart is simply a story. When you can't say anything about what dark matter is or what dark energy is, it's a story. It just says that gravitationally, these things have to be there, but what they are isn't understood. Okay, we're going to move on to smaller scale now. And the smaller scale is moving down to the idea of what is a minor sector. How do we see galaxies as minor sectors? So on page 168, the rotational center of your minor sector is situated far away in the enormous and dense star cloud of Sagittarius, around which your local universe and its associated creations all move, and from opposite sides of the vast Sagittarius subgalactic system, you may observe two great streams of star clouds emerging in stupendous stellar coils. Now this, this is something that, again, has probably thrown careful readers of the Urantia book for a long time. Sagittarius, in the night sky, in the summertime, in the south, is this wonderful splotch of the Milky Way. It's perfectly visible. You can't miss it. It is really gorgeous. And the Arantia book is saying that the center of our minor sector is located in this direction. Well, it turns out that the center of the Milky Way is exactly in that direction. When you look into the, Sag the Sagittarius center, we are looking exactly towards the middle of the Milky Way. It's commonly understood. There's nothing, 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 uh, there's nothing confusing about that, whatever. But what they're going on to say here is that there are two streams of stellar coils emerging from it. And so here's an example of a galaxy with two huge streams of stellar coils. In fact, we started this entire presentation with an image of M51, which is again an example of a barred spiral galaxy with two streams of stellar coils. So there's a nice parallel here. But here's the funny thing. This was not validatable until 2008. As of 2008, we now have data showing that our Milky Way consists of two huge streams of stellar coils like this. The previous image is this one. And again, the, the great thing about this is the artist who produced these images is the same artist. And in one case, he has produced the traditional image that was relevant up until 2008, and now we have this wonderful image in 2008. And the previous image was multitudinous arms uh, that, the, uh, that uh, the Milky Way seemed to be constructed of. And that, in, in, all, in all astronomy books up until 2008, that's what you would have seen as the representation of Milky Way, and it's no longer accepted. And here's the problem. You see, we're, again, we're back to the same problem. When you want to see arms, when you want to document arms in our galaxy, how do you do it? Because what you have to do is you have to look out through the stars that, can, that make up the band of the Milky Way. It's really hard to do. It is very hard to do. 
But to document what's going on out there, you have to do it. Now, it turns out the space, the Spitzer Space Telescope is a new scope. It's an infrared scope. And it's able to penetrate to some degree what's going on out through the vast billions of stars that comprise the Milky Way. Remember, we can, in the, in Deep Space Explorer, we're easily able to look out into the north and south, above and below the Milky Way, and document everything that's out there. But when you try to look through the Milky Way, you've got a problem. And the Spitzer Space Telescope was able to do that, and in the course of looking out there, it tossed out the idea of multitudinous arms and said, guess what, we're a barred spiral. And it does fit this, it does fit this rangeable image. So insofar as Erwin Ginsberg and other people have been suggesting to us for a long time that the Milky Way is a minor sector, that our minor sector of ENSA is the Milky Way. This really, as of 2008, pictorially um, um, stands, stands to be pretty firm. Rancho book. Even the major and minor sectors of Orvanton are, to us, clearly distinguishable. But it's not so easy to identify the physical boundaries of the local universe. Yeah, so, so now, now given the fact that I've walked you this far, if a minor sector is a galaxy, if a major sector is a whole lot of galaxies, you can see why they are clearly distinguishable. Because astronomy takes great pictures. Hubble was taking great pictures of galaxies and clusters of galaxies. But where it's referring to local universes, well, you know, if, you, if you're looking at just a fuzzy little group of stars within any given galaxy, a star cloud, well, that's not going to be easy to identify. Salvington, the headquarters of Nebadon, is situated at the exact energy mass center of the local universe. But your local universe is not a single astronom astronomic system, though a large system does exist at its physical center. So again, a star cloud, it can be many groups of open clusters of stars, all gravitationally bound together, but it's, it's really hard to look up there and to take a photograph and to say it starts here and ends here, not possible. Such is the constitution of the local star cloud of Nebadon, which today swings in an increasingly settled orbit around the Sagittarius center of that minor sector of Arvanton to which our local creation belongs. So we're really back to where I was showing you that image of, of a star cloud hanging on the edge of an, the Andromeda galaxy. And it's the same image, that our local star cloud of Nebadon is a grouping of stars hanging on the edge of the Milky Way in rotation, drifting around the Sagittarius arm, this great huge arm, one of who, you know, so we saw that image of two great arms, two great stellar coils, and it fits very nicely. So finally, the idea here is that if the Milky Way is one minor sector, again, of a thousand minor sectors, the Megap Orvington, then Orvington would contain a thousand galaxies. Coincidentally, the size of our Virgo supercluster that we are on the edge of, which is also watch-like in shape, consists of about a thousand galaxies. And as huge as that is, it is simply just one two hundred millionth of the known universe. Okay, so it's huge. Our Virgo supercluster is huge, and yet it's still just one two hundred millionth of the known universe, and that fits the Ranch Book's suggestion that only a tiny, tiny part of the master universe is inhabited as the grand universe. Remember, the Ranch Book gives us this image of the grand universe, it has seven super universes, is inhabited, but it's tiny because the so-called outer space levels are just absolutely enormous. And so the idea that our grand universe might be just you know, fractions of a millionth of the entire universe fits really well. So here we have, we're back again here to this, this earlier image of a star cloud in rotation around a galaxy. So it's not so easy to identify the physical borders. And so the thousands of stars comprising a system and a constellation then would be astronomically indistinguishable. So constellations and systems would be just, you couldn't simply take them apart astronomically any more than you could take apart the local, the local universe. So I can't really speak to how, you know, where you would go looking for a constellation grouping of stars, because it would be almost impossible to try to pick that one out. So again, we're back to a slide we saw in the very beginning where we're equating Urantia book terms with what astronomy knows about. And so think of the master universe as equivalent to the universe as we currently think about it. 
The super universe is equivalent to a local, to a super cluster. Uh, a major sector would be uh, simply a cluster of galaxies. So we are part of the Virgo cluster of galaxies on the edge of the Virgo supercluster of galaxies. And a minor sector, again, is equivalent to the Milky Way galaxy and on down solar system and the Earth. So I've had to build you all the way up through the talk to get to that so that it feels good. Now what I want to do is address a couple of minor problems that the Orange Book speaks about and, and how to see them in the light of the history of the appearance of the Orange Book. So the classical one is why is it quoted that the Andromeda galaxy is a million light years away when astronomy says it's more than two million light years away? Andromeda, which is outside the inhabited super universe, is very active. This far distant nebula is visible to the naked eye and when you view it, pause to consider that the light you behold left those distant suns almost one million years ago. So here's the problem term, one million, one million years. That's the problem. Okay, here's the architecture of the universe expressing the science of the times. Architecture of the universe. Silhouetted against the sky in the constellation Andromeda is a tiny patch of light hardly visible to the eye. It is the great nebula of Andromeda one of the giants of the universe, a thing so large that light takes 50,000 years to cross it, but so far away that this light takes nearly a million years to reach us. So the Revelatory Commission was constrained. They really had to use not just the concepts of the time, but the science of the times. And so that's where the million years comes from. Uh, from the Urantia Book Reader's points of view, I want to point out this image. Again, Andromeda outside the inhabited super universe does not put it outside of, into, it doesn't, that simply doesn't put it into the outer space levels. But I will say this, that right now astronomy looks at Andromeda as being an extremely hot galaxy. And right now part of the, part of the theorizing about life in other galaxies is that life can only occur in habitable zones of galaxies where there are settled star systems that can support it. Andromeda, even from the point of view of science, is thought to be a pretty messy place in terms of the possibility for possible life because of all the activity that's going on in Andromeda. So again, Andromeda is our nearest neighbor. That doesn't mean that it's out in the outer space universe is from this phraseology. Um, I'm just going to quickly show you a bit of the scale here. Here's Andromeda sitting over here. Here is our Milky Way galaxy. The distance they give is 2.65 million light years. So this, so if we're trying to figure out how big um, a local group is, our local group is, the local group term actually is not a Urantia Book term, it is an astronomy term. The local group of galaxies embraces Andromeda and a few other smaller galaxies, but the, but the Milky Way and Andromeda dominate the local group, but if this is still too far small a size to be the major sector of 100 minor sectors. But note the number here, 2.65. What would the Orange Book have quoted to come up with an accurate number? It said a million, but if it had said, say, 2 million or 2.4, which was accurate as of 10 years ago, and now it's 2.65, what's the accurate number? You see, the Orange Book number, whatever number they used, would have been wrong at some point in time because it's always being corrected. If we look on a larger scale of 100, 200 million light years in this grouping, we start to see galaxy clusters and galaxy, clusters of galaxies, these are the building blocks of a universe. In your book terms, the Virgo major sector uh, and somewhat beyond the Virgo major sector would be the building block for a super universe. Go ahead. Superclusters of galaxies only approximate a super universe. The Urantia book the seven super universes are not primary organi physical organizations. Nowhere do their boundaries divide a nebula family. Neither do they cross a local universe, a prime creative unit. Each super universe is simply a geographic space clustering of approximately one seventh of the organized and partially inhabited post Havona creation. So here's a problem. I'm, I'm asking you to take your idea of a super universe and associate a super universe with a super cluster of galaxies. But the Orange Book is saying here that that is even somewhat problematic 
because it's it's more of an administrative issue that the Arendtia book says when they're talking about one seventh of an energy grouping is comprising a super universe. So in this graph, the seven super universes might be thought to occupy the region of superclusters, and it's it's really not easy to see so much on this slide unless you get a very good look from Virgo towards Hercules. Again, outer space levels would be way beyond this region. They would be much farther out in space. So again, on large scale, superclusters of galaxies are the building blocks in your entropic term, super universes of the grand universe and somewhat beyond. We're starting to begin to see the edges of what the Arendtia book says of the first outer space level at the scale. Here's what's problematic. Um, this, this is what's problematic. This slide, with all its arrows pointing in all these directions, and again, the arrows are trending together. These arrows are representations not of stars in motions, but of galaxies in motions. So these are huge collections of galaxies in motion together on this slide. And again, this was not, they couldn't even begin to document this sort of motion, this large scale motion of, of galaxies until the 1980s. Orvington, the seventh super universe, swings on between super universes one and six, having not long since, as we reckon time, turned the southeastern bend of the super universe space level. It's, it's, it's really a fun story that the Arendtia book tells. It, it, you know, it gives directions and it gives a north and a south and it's clearly pretty fanciful, but, but, the, the, but the reality is, at the time of the 1920s and 30s, even Einstein and Hubble thought of the universe as being a pretty homogenous place. Uh, it was known that galaxies were everywhere and that everything in the universe was expanding away from everything else, but it was still thought to be a pretty homogenous, smooth-looking universe. And now we know that it's far, far, far more chaotic than anything those, those early physicists and astrophysicists would have assumed. And this graph of the motion of galaxies clearly expresses it, but the Arendtia book told us the story, and it said super universes. So we have a hundred, we have a thousand galaxies within a super universe, and these thousand galaxies are in motion with other groups of thousands of galaxies, and it's talking about large-scale motion long before there was any suggestion that anything like that was happening. Island universes. Okay, so this is the term island universe. Um, as, as, as being, it, you know, the question is, well, what does it mean by an island universe? So go ahead and read this Randwick phrase. In the not distant future, new telescopes will reveal to the wondering gaze of Urantian astronomers no less than 375 million new galaxies in the remote stretches of outer space. At the same time, these more powerful telescopes will disclose that many island universes formerly believed to be in outer space are really a part of the galactic system of Orvington. Yeah, just to know the term, galaxies and island universes, they're pretty much equatable in this in this phrase, and it really, again, it's 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 the it's the it's the revelatory commission's attempt to anticipate usage. So the term galaxies. This is one of the 20 times that the term galaxy appears in the Arantia book, and it's equating with island universe, and that really fits the Hubble's Hubble's language. This perfectly fits Hubble's language because they freely use that that term also, island universe. So how to read this with 20th century eyes? Um, now that we understand something of the larger dimensions of, these univer of the universe, these island universes can be seen to be part of the thousand or so galaxies that make up the Virgo supercluster or super universe. So what about outer space universes as visible and uninhabited? There actually is a vast and new system of universes gradually organizing in the domains of outer space. New orders of physical creations, enormous and gigantic circles of swarming universes upon universes, far out beyond the present boundaries of the peopled and organized creations, are actually visible through your telescopes. At present, these outer creations are wholly physical. They are apparently uninhabited and seem to be devoid of creature administration. Yeah, so we've already talked about the fact that the grand universe, the inhabitable part of the universe of all the universe, the master universe, is only one two hundred millionth. It's tiny. And so here's a reference to it. But here's the term universe upon universes. As you read we're used to we're used to seeing that kind of phraseology. To everyone else, it sounds silly. That doesn't make any sense. But if you think of universe upon universes as representing universe of galaxies, a universe of galaxies, 
it makes all the sense in the world. So when the Urantia book uses the term universe of universes, and remember at the time the Urantia book was written, everyone thought that the universe was the same thing as the Milky Way or a galaxy. The term universe of galaxies, universe of Milky Ways, universe of island universes, they, those make sense. So here we have clearly universe upon universes refers to galaxy clusters. Modern physics doesn't even begin, even though modern physics is grappling with the idea that there could be universes parallel to our universe in other dimensions, it would not allow for swarms of universes the way that the Urantia book seems to suggest. So let's talk just a little bit about some of the other people that were critical to Hubble's work. A major one is George Ellery Hale. He's the builder of the Hale Hooker Telescope and later Mount Palomar. Um, Hale was a money guy, so here's Hale on the left and here's Hubble on the right. And Hubble is sitting in his, the chair that he's sitting in, this classic looking chair. If you go to visit the um, Hale Hooker Telescope in Pas above Pasadena, the chair is still there. And Hubble would sit in that chair all night long. I don't know how he did it, <laughs> but he would keep his telescope locked on. He was a great astro. He was the great astrophotographer. He took great plates, and that's the reason he was able to do the work he did. But he was he had to, his telescope had to be built, and it was built by Hale, who was a money guy. Hale was a driven man. The first major telescope that Hale built actually is just north of just north of Chicago, up in Lake Geneva. That was his first great scope. Um, and then he went on to build this one. But Hale was a driven guy, and insofar as the revelatory commission needed for Hubble to finish his work, it needed for Hale to do his work. And there's a very curious story about Hale right here. So this is from a biography of George Ellery Hale. So taking a break. Taking a break to relax, Hale traveled. On his way to Egypt, he stopped at Mentone on the Riviera. One night there, when he was sitting in his room, a little man suddenly appeared to him. They began a conversation. The elf-like creature was soon advising Hale on technical matters, fundraising, and the general conduct of his life. <laughs> the elf appeared to Hale oft, often during the construction of the Mount Wilson telescope. I was looking at a picture of a man who built a telescope that allowed mankind to take the measure of the unimaginable vastness of the universe and comprehend its motion of galaxies. It was only later that I learned Hale had climbed the walls at night, tortured by nightmares, until an imaginary elf helped him in his hour of need. <laughs> so don't we all need a little uplift on occasion from our celestial helpers, whether they be seraphim or midwayers or who they happen to be? Isn't that fun? Isn't that fun? So we have this poor driven Hale, and he is just driven to want to build his telescopes. And um, he gets some help, apparently. He was, he, he was a curious character, a very curious figure in, in the early history of astronomy. And as Urantia book readers, we may have a take on why he was so driven. <laughs> yeah, so the universe needed him as, as, as just as much as it needed Hubble. Um, here's just another quick story. This is Harlow Shapley on the left and Milton Humason on the right. Go ahead. In the Urantia book, from Jerusalem, it is over 200,000 light years to the physical center of the super universe of Orvington. There are funny numbers in the Urantia book to account for. And this is one of those funny numbers. And this funny number possibly has its source in Harlow Shapley and Milton Humason. Shapley preceded Hubble. He was the astronomer in charge before Hubble took over. And Shapley was not really willing to go where Hubble wanted to go. Sh uh, um, Hubble, um, he may have been Hubble's predecessor. Uh, H Humason was a very interesting character. Humason was one of the guys that was the road builder to create the telescope. And he went on to actually work in the observatory. But he was uneducated. And he ended up being just one of the great astronomers up there, even though he didn't have a formal education. And he tried to get his, his he tried to get Shapley to go along with the idea that in fact the Milky Way was only one galaxy. And Shapley didn't want to go there. What Shapley did was, Shapley used the data that they were getting from the telescope to say that in fact the Milky Way was much, much, much bigger than it's now known to be. 
So earlier in the earlier slide, we saw that the that Andromeda was thought to be 50,000 light years across. Well, Andromeda is now known, just as the Milky Way is known, to be way over 100,000 light years across. Shapley, in order not to go in the direction that Hubble went in admitting that there could be millions of other galaxies, said, well, maybe the Milky Way is hundreds of thousands of miles big. So insofar as the Arrange book has funny comments like 200,000 light years to the physical center, I think they're, having, they're being forced again to rely on the science of the times which is suggesting, as Shapley did, and he was the major astronomer, he went on to Harvard, actually, after he left here, to use numbers like that. That is part of the constraint. I, this, this one I don't feel as comfortable with, but this, I think, is part of where some of the funny numbers come from. It's the science of the times. So we have Hubble, an American. Hubble made his fellow astronomers crazy because he insisted, even though he's an American, he insisted on, he, he, had, he had been at Oxford, his education was in Oxford, he, and he insisted on dressing in knickers and speaking with an effective British accent. And he also spoke to elves and sharply resisted seeing the obvious, and the work of the universe got done in spite of it all. <laughs> so, you know, the universe uses us in whatever form we're willing to make ourselves available. Here's another, just as, just as with the Andromeda distance problem, here is the Mercury and the Moon apparent problem that troubled Durangibook readers for a long time. And again, it's an old paradigm, new paradigm issue. So it seems to suggest one thing in 1934 and another to our age. The planets nearest the Sun were the first to have their revolution slowed down by tidal friction. Such gravitational influences also contribute to the stabilization of planetary orbits while acting as a break on the rate of planetary axial revolution, causing a planet to revolve even slower until axial revolution ceases, leaving one hemisphere of the planet always turned toward the sun or larger body, as is illustrated by the planet Mercury and by the moon, which always turns the same face toward the Urantia. Now, most Urantia book readers, since we've taken up reading the book since the 1970s, looked at that paragraph and said, that's crazy because we know that Mercury revolves. The moon keeps the same face toward the Earth, but the Mercury goes around the sun and it revolves around the sun. But that actually wasn't known until the 1960s. So it was only in 1965 that Mercury was found to have a very slow rotation of its surface around the sun. Now, the funny thing is, I, I'm, I'm always, I've always been amused that the Arantia book even contains this paragraph because it seems potentially confusing and misleading. The great thing about this paragraph is I think it's the revelator's way of telling us that they knew exactly what the score was. That in the old paradigm, Mercury kept its face toward the sun. In the new paradigm with the new science, Mercury revolves and they used a language that could be read either way. I don't think this needed to be included in the Arantia book, and it was included, and I really think it was a fun way for them to display their ability to use language to tell us many things in many different contexts. Okay, we're returning to the architecture of the universe as source material. Again, the architecture of the universe is a funny book. The architecture of the universe contains within it an explanation using equations, something that most popularized science books don't do explaining the, the theory of relativity. And he also mixes in it his own philosophy and his own theology. It's just a wonderful admixture. So, and the Arantia book. The super universe of Orbiton is illustrated and is illuminated and warmed by more than 10 trillion blazing suns. These suns are the stars of your observable astronomic system. More than two trillion are too distant and too small ever to be seen from Urantia. But in the master universe, there are as many suns as there are glasses of water in the oceans of your world. Now remember, master universe means the universe of all universes in the Urantia book? Okay. Architecture of the universe. But the great nebula of Andromeda is only one of the million such nebula, each a little universe of its own, bound to us in one great universe by those all-pervading messengers, the light photons, which bring the story of our neighbors to us. The number of stars in the, grand, in the grander universe is possibly about 10,000 million, 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 one times 10 to the 22nd. 
In other words, there are about as many stars in the grander universe as there are glasses of water in all the oceans of the world. <laughs> So this is just one of the very, very, very clear borrowings that the Revelatory Commission made in inclusion in the Orange Book. The only thing they didn't borrow was the term grander universe because they wanted to use the term master universe. <laughs> but eventually, they, of course, they did use the term grand universe for another purpose. But note this figure. This is a very curious number of 1 times 10 to the 22 being arrived at in 1934. So this is a picture. Uh, this is a photograph that the Hubble Space Telescope made in 1996. So uh, the Hubble Space Telescope was pointed at an area near, the, uh, near um, the Big Dipper that seemingly had no previously discovered objects within it. It was the size of a grain of sand, but they pointed it there and left, left the telescope pointed there for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, we end up with, with this photograph, and it clearly contains many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of galaxies, tiny dwarf infant galaxies. Now, based on that photograph, expanded to the entire night sky, the Hubble Deep Field suggests that there are about 200 billion galaxies in the universe. Now, if each of those 200 billion galaxies has, a 50, billion, has 50 billion stars, then we have exactly 1 times 10 to the 22 stars. Now, how in 1934, this guy came up with exactly the same number that was arrived at using Hubble's space telescope in 1996. How's that for interesting about the architecture of the universe and good old Swan? It's the, it is just one of these really fun things that you wonder what is driving people when they're writing and propelled to write as Swan did with the architecture of the universe. It, it is just extraordinary to me. It's, it, the, the 200 billion number is a fun number. So if you, think of, if you think of any given galaxy as containing, you know, 50, 100, 200 billion stars, think of that number of stars as being equivalent to the number of galaxies in the universe. So it's kind of a fun number to hold on to. The Great Attractor. The Great Attractor. This is our next, this is, we're nearing the end here. Observation. Observation of the so-called Milky Way discloses the comparative increase in Orvington's stellar density when the heavens are viewed in one direction, while on either side the density diminishes. The number of stars and other spheres decreases away from the chief plane of our material superuniverse. When the angle of observation is propitious, gazing through the main body of this realm of maximum density, you are looking toward the residential universe and the center of all things. Earlier, when I, showed, when I showed some images of the Milky Way at night in Sagittarius, and if we had a nice dark place to observe from, and you could look into that milky band of light where Sagittarius is, the Arrangement Book says that if you could look directly into and through that direction, you'd be looking toward the residential universe and the center of all things. So in the night sky, when we can see Sagittarius, imagine, you know, that at that point in time, we could, if you're looking through that direction, you're looking through to the center of all things. Now, it's very curious, very, very curious, that in the 1980s again, there's an object called the Great Attractor, and behind it, the Shapley Concentration. The Great Attractor and Shapley behind it is, represents the biggest, um, you could say the heaviest and most physically powerful point in all the universe documentable in these regions. It's drawing a million galaxies toward it, of which ours is one, and it's exactly in that direction that the Arrangement Book says that we would be looking toward the center of all things. So again here, here is an image in the night sky of, this is, this is Sagittarius at night, so here, this is actually a gorgeous <laughs> photograph, if we could clearly see it. So we would be looking toward, through this, toward the maximum density toward the central universe, as well as toward the great attractor. In, now we're returning, finally, to the same slide that we started with. In this slide, at the, in the middle, is the Milky Way, surrounded by these colorized groupings of superclusters of galaxies. And note that there's a handful of them. And they are all in motion around this object right here called the Great Attractor. And again, 
The problem with really documenting the great attractor is that we have to look through the band of the Milky Way to say anything about it. And, it's, and so it is very recent science that's been able to say much of anything about the great attractor. The problem with the great attractor in terms of science is that even though this huge variety of super clusters of galaxies is in motion around it, there is nothing in this region like a super cluster of galaxies for all these other super clusters of galaxies to be circling it. There really is nothing observable there. So what is it that's driving all this collection of super clusters of galaxies to move around the great attractor? Uh, we could call it the central universe. <laughs> As the Orange Book readers, we can do that. So it's fun. It's really fun that the story of the Orange Book contains within itself something suggestive of things that physics and astronomy have not quite observed yet. It doesn't make it true, but it's wonderful that it's there. Because really, for the last 15 years, the Orange Book science guys have wondered if the great attractor might really have anything to do with the central universe. Well, we don't know. We may never know. But maybe as astronomy is better able to penetrate things using things like the Spitzer telescope and look in that direction, we'll be able to say more about it. But the Orange Book does present that image of large scale motion, which was not documentable back in the 1930s. And we have all these super clusters of galaxies. And Rancho Book talks about seven super universes. And here we have a nice handful of super clusters, maybe super universes, in motion around the great attractor. So again, it's just a really, really glorious parallel. So what I want you to take away from this talk, and again, in the upper right-hand corner, we have our now familiar super universes in motion, super clusters in motion. So I want you again to learn to associate the term super universe with a thousand, of, a, of a thousand minor sectors with a super cluster which contains about a thousand galaxies. So there really are structures which astronomy sees which resemble what the Orange Book says in its story about the universe. Our Milky Way is one minor sector. It's on the edge of the Virgo supercluster. And there are several of these superclusters in motion around the great attractor. So let go of your 21st century definitions of what a universe is, as well as your modern ideas of a galaxy, if you want to read the Orange Book as it's written. Because the Orange Book was not written with these understandings in use at that time. The universe of universes meant the same as a universe of galaxies or a universe of nebulae. And there was really only one master universe. Uh, the universe in today's terms. And again, I'm only suggesting a nice fit. This is just a wonderful fit. The Rancho book presents a story that has a wonderful fit with modern astronomy. And it does make sense. The Rancho book really does make sense in the view of modern astronomy. So returning to the final page, we began with the first page of the architecture of the universe, and we're ending with the final page of the architecture of the universe. There is one great work of art. It is the universe. Ye men of letters, find the imprints of its majesty in your sense of the beauty of words. Ye men of song, find it in the harmony of sweet sounds. Ye lovers are conscious of its beauties in forms ye can but ill define. Ye men of science, find it in the rich harmonies of nature's mathematical design. And so, dear mortals, if ye should pray for anything, pray that ye may find senses to which all nature's beauties bring response. For then ye be as angels, and heaven shall be your habitation. <laughs> Final page of the architecture of the universe, and the last slide for this talk. <laughs>